Hello and welcome back. I am John Strohmeyer with Strohmeyer Law. Today on our live stream, we are going through a number of the questions that y'all have had about trusts. Trusts are a wonderful tool. We use them a lot in estate planning, but they can get very confusing very quickly. So we've got a few questions on some of the more advanced or deeper aspects of trusts. When can we use them? What can we actually get out of them? What makes sense for you and your family? So with that in mind, what I'm going to do is actually... grab a marker so I had that ready. You'd think I'd be ready for things like this. But with that in mind, what is our first question? So why would I use a trust? Well, a trust is a good vehicle for making sure that the right person is in charge of stuff for somebody else. A good way to think about it is you're putting stuff in a bucket for somebody else. And here's where, you know, here, a bucket. We can put stuff inside this bucket. What do we want to do there? I don't know. But the way to think about it, you know, first we're going to put stuff in. The great thing about a bucket is it's also going to have a spigot where stuff can come out. And when stuff comes out, it's going to come out generally in one of three ways. So first way, and that's what we normally think of, beneficiaries. This is the people you're putting stuff into trust for. We're going to put your stuff in the trust. The trustee is going to own it. When the trustee is ready or thinks it's appropriate, they're going to open the spigot and money, property, whatever is going to come out to the beneficiary. Well, way number two that stuff can come out. Not as much fun as a beneficiary getting a distribution, but this is going to be some sort of expense. Well, we've got to pay to maintain things, so costs associated with maintaining the property. This is really, you know, how do we keep things running? So trustee fees, lawyers, just whatever expenses are managed on behalf of that. Finally, you know, kind of a subset of expenses, but just other administrative costs. So this could be, you know, salary, investments, whatever you need to keep the trust running. So you put stuff in as the trustee. That bucket is there. The trustee is in charge. So the trustee is in charge. They're making sure they're opening the buckets, uh, spigots at the right times for either beneficiary desk. The trustee is there to make sure that the three spigots get opened correctly for paying expenses, administrative costs, and also thinking about how do we get stuff to the beneficiaries. Well, that's a good way of thinking about it. So we can design how those spigots come out, who gets what and when. What do we want to think about? Well, you know, if we're going to have to pay for taxes, we want to think about, well, how do we manage this? How do we ma manage tax costs between the beneficiary and the trustee, because one of them is going to have to pay income tax. Putting stuff in a trust doesn't mean that income tax is eliminated, it just means it's going to get allocated between the trustee and the beneficiary. The trustee has an obligation to pay that tax. It's not like a corporation where there's one layer of tax at the corporate level and then another layer of tax when there are distributions known as dividends made to the shareholders. It's not like partnership tax where the entity, if it's an LLC or limited liability partnership or some other type of entity that is elected to be taxed as a partnership, just collects all the tax attributes and then has passed through taxation, meaning that the partners are the ones responsible for it. Now, in a trust, the income is allocated between the trustee and the beneficiary who receives the distribution. So if the beneficiary gets all of the income, then the income will be taxed at the beneficiary level. If all of the income is retained by the trustee, 
then the trustee is going to pay tax on that. And you can have some going back and forth. You know, if the income stays inside the bucket, the income tax comes out from inside the bucket. If the income goes out to the beneficiary, then it's the beneficiary who's going to be responsible for paying that tax. Again, how do we get stuff in? So we've talked about it. Why do we want to get stuff in the trust? Well, this is a bucket that we get to design for our beneficiaries. When we start thinking about how do we get it in, how do we take care of those beneficiaries, we're going to want to start thinking, all right, well, we've got our stuff. Different things are going to need to be titled and transferred in in different ways. So coming up with a few examples, if you had a brokerage account, well, this is actually pretty easy. Brokerage account, you're just going to go to your broker and say, we need to transfer title of the account. The titling of the account should no longer be Joe Smith individually. It should be Joe Smith, comma, trustee of the Joe Smith Trust. Easy enough. That's some paperwork. You'll probably need an employer identification number or an EIN. That will be a separate tax identification number for the trustee. So it's not on their personal assets. It's not going to show up on their personal tax return. The trustee is doing their own separate job, helps keep things separate. So the brokerage account, whether it's Fidelity or Merrill Lynch or whoever it is, they'll record the account as being owned by the trust. What if it's a piece of real estate? You know, we, we've got a rental property. How do we get that in? Well, this is where the deed, you know, there will be some deed. Joe Smith assigns, uses special warranty deed, perhaps general warranty deed is transferring the property from his own name into the trust. So a deed might be another place. What if you owned an LLC, limited liability company interest? Again, just an assignment along with whatever consents you might need from the other members in that LLC. That'll have that'll help get stuff into the trust. When the trustee receives that property, it's their job to go through a number of things to make sure they know what has been done. So we want to think first about allocations of what that trustee has received. And then we're also going to think about distributions as well. Because one of the things that a trust does from the outset, trust is there to make distributions to beneficiaries both present and then the remainder beneficiaries. So that's those remainder beneficiaries or anybody after the current beneficiaries. For now, let's just assume we have one primary beneficiary who's receiving distributions right now. And when that primary beneficiary, we'll call him Pete, dies, then the remainder beneficiary, Robert, gets to step in. So if we don't say anything else, generally the law says that the primary beneficiary, Pete, gets to receive distributions of trust income, but not trust principal. The trust principal will go to Robert when Pete has died. Okay, John, well, what is trust income in principal? So this is where we go back to, as things come in, we're going to allocate. When assets come into the trust, we're going to allocate between trust income and trust principal. Basically, we're going to divide the bucket. Trust income is going to come out and Pete's going to get income and Robert will get the principal. Well, if we put in a brokerage account and we put in a piece of real property, those are both going to be trust principal. Those are assets. They are the primary stuff that is being held by the trust. So we put that in this side of the bucket, principal bucket. Those are assets. Now, that doesn't mean that we can actually get anything into Pete's hands just yet. We're going to want to get some actual income. And income should think of as return on trust principal, return on your investment. So the rental property, well, we're going to have some expenses and administrative costs to make sure that we get that out to them. Uh, we're going to 
pay those. And then once we've got that return, if there's anything left from rental payments, then that becomes income that can go out to Pete. Now, when we think about anything else, you know, like again, that principal as it's coming in, we're going to classify always between principal and income because that's the first thing that the beneficiary is going to be thinking about is which part of this can I get at? The trustee is going to be thinking about what can I make available for the beneficiaries to make sure I'm doing my job as the trustee. So as assets go in, you're characterizing, allocating between principal and income. As they're coming out, you're making sure that you know Pete, as the primary beneficiary, knows this is what you're entitled to. This is where the distribution standard will be important. You'll, in a lot of cases, see something that says, well, the you know the primary beneficiary is entitled to distributions of principal and income for health education, maintenance, and support. That ma health education, maintenance, and support is our distribution standard. It says, well, look, we've, you trustee are going to have to look at Pete. Does he need money for health or education? maintenance and support, keeping him in his standard of living. If so, you can open both the principal bucket or the principal spigot and the income spigot if you're allowed to open both principal and income. If there's nothing about principal and income, if it just says you may make distributions of principal and income, normally going to think it's just income that can come out. But again, you're going to have to look at your state law. This is what we want to do when we think about letting assets out. When assets come back in, or when assets go in, we want to make sure they're titled appropriately in the name of the trust. The trustee should have a good ledger of exactly what assets there are. So having a list of assets, a schedule of assets there so that not only the trustee now knows what, they're, what they have, but any future trustee who steps in knows what assets have been there. Why? It's important to know this because a beneficiary generally is entitled to demand an accounting of the trust. And what this is, is a detailed list of everything that has come in and gone out of the trust. Who got it? Why did they get it? And that way the trustee can show this is what we've done with all of the assets. More importantly, none of the assets have gone to any place they have not been appropriately designated. Yeah, more importantly, trustee hasn't put it in his or her pocket, the trustee has not made a distribution to somebody who's not entitled to it, or the trustee just hasn't wasted the assets. So there are a lot of reasons to do this. The big thing to think about is the trustee wants to track as it comes in what they've received. Is it allocated to principal or income? When assets are going out, are they an expense, administrative cost, or is it a distribution? Again, being able to balance and show this is what has come in and this is what has gone out. All right, so I think that really covers that first question. So I did just uh, see this question. Yeah, do trust documents or any things need to be executed or restated to update a schedule of assets? Well, when you typically sign the original trust agreement, nothing is in that agree in that trust just yet. The trustee hasn't accepted any property. You may have a $10 bill here or there, but really you're not putting anything else in the trust right then unless you've got the paperwork right there. You don't have to re-execute any particular schedule, but you should have a good running list. There's no specified form or you have to have the Schedule A notarized but the trustee needs to know what's in their trust. So when you think about it, you know, what does a trustee need to do when they receive those assets? They need to make sure they've got a good list of it. If they're doing their accountings on a regular basis, they probably want to account and show here we've received this asset and we've allocated all of it to principal or we've allocated some of it to income. Good question. So getting into our more advanced topics. What are charitable remainder trusts and how do they work? Do they even make sense? So we talked about this bucket and we can design what it looks like. Charitable remainder trusts are set up in such a way that somebody who wants to put property away right now is going to make a certain gift. The beneficiary initially is going to be an individual who is not a charity. So initially, 
non-charitable. After that non-charitable beneficiary passes away or the term of years ends, then it's going to go to some charity at the end of the day. And then the charity gets to do with it what they want. So again, we're going to put assets in. So we're going to fund assets. Yeah, we're going to fund assets into the trust. The non-charitable beneficiaries are going to get distributions initially. Then the charity is going to be there at the end. So CRT, charitable remainder, meaning the charity is the remainder beneficiary after the non-charitable beneficiary. There are also charitable lead trusts where the charity gets the payments up front, then the non-charitable beneficiaries receive it after it. Both have their pluses and minuses, but it, you know when you think about them, it's about how do you split up the benefit between a charity and a non-charitable beneficiary. Now, there are a lot of reasons to think about this. The reason we do think about this for clients, you can get some significant estate and gift tax savings. You can also generate some income tax deductions for yourself on this. There are some special things that go on with these trusts because they are ultimately going to charity. They do have some special tax benefits for income tax purposes. Primarily, they are treated as though they are a non-taxable entity, which is great. As those trusts generate income, they're not paying income tax on it. Here is the key on charitable remainder trusts. It doesn't mean that the beneficiaries, the non-charitable beneficiaries, don't pay income tax on it. Remember, we talked about how trustees are responsible for certain income tax and beneficiaries are going to be responsible for income tax or in, taxable income that is distributed to them. A charitable remainder trust does not turn non-taxable or it doesn't turn taxable income into non-taxable income forever. It only delays that income tax because the trustee is not going to pay tax on it, but the beneficiary, when they receive distributions, will. So what are we going to be thinking about? Well, let's kind of go back to the beginning and really start with how this looks and how this feels. Charitable remainder trusts are what we call split interest trusts. You make contribution to the trust. You may get some tax deductions up front. But because the charitable uh, beneficiary at the end is going to receive the assets, there's this charitable portion that is there to incentivize things. Now, the primary non-charitable beneficiary, that lead beneficiary, they can, it can be you. You can keep that income for yourself. You can give it away to child, family member, and you can have that income stream there for a number of years, as long as it's no more than 20 years or it can be for the rest of the life of yourself or you know my child's life for the rest of their life, then on to the charity. Now, charitable remainder trusts come in two main flavors. You can have a charitable remainder annuity trust where that charitable remainder annuity trust or a CRAT is going to distribute a fixed annuity amount, a fixed dollar amount every year, and you can't put more money into the trust. So if it runs out of money, then there we go. Charitable remainder unit trusts distribute a fixed percentage of the balance of the trust assets every year and additional contributions can be made. So on the way in you, for a unit trust, you're just saying, look, 5% of whatever's in the trust every year comes back to the non-charitable beneficiary. Because it's a percentage, generally you're going to keep stuff going. You know, It's not gonna run out of assets because that percentage isn't there. The annuity trust, though, we need to make sure that, and there are some complicated calculations on this, but as assets go in, we need to make sure that the, the amount that's coming out will actually sub, uh, substantiate the full distributions that are going to come out to that non-charitable beneficiary. You know, if we're saying, well, we're going to put a million dollars in and we're going to take $100,000 out <clears throat> every year for the rest of this person's life, Unless that person is expected to live less than a year or two, that trust is probably not going to qualify because all the money is going to come back out to that non-charitable beneficiary. Nothing's going to go to the charity. So, you know, again, thinking about how can we make sure that the numbers are going to work, 
then we also want to think about, well, we're going to have to substantiate these distributions. What can we put in this trust? You may put cash, you may put some publicly traded securities, um, some types of closely held business interests can be put in there. Specifically, you cannot put a an S corporation shares in there, but other types of closely held entities can go in. The trick though is you can't have that be a related business um, because if you run out of cash, you might get in a sticky situation where you, you may have to sell a portion of the company or make a distribution of that company to the charity. Finally, real estate or certain other uh, assets, these are things you could put in. Again, <clears throat> for this to work, you have to be charitably motivated. If you're looking at this as an income tax play, it's really not a great idea because you're going to have to make distributions to a charity. A significant portion of the assets is going to go to that charity. Now, you may say, well, look, we're, you know, we're going to put a million dollars in and we're going to take $500,000 out. Okay, well, 500,000 is still going to a charity. Once we think about that, you know, some of the things that I'd also mentioned, we need to think about the income tax in the meantime, because when we look at the assets going in, remember, trust, the trustee is required to distribute between or allocate between principal and income on the way in. Now, for a charitable remainder trust, when they're allocating between that income, they've then got to think about what type of income do they have? Because there are actually, you know, officially there are four tiers of income. And that income really comes out in the most expensive income first. So that's what comes out to the charitable beneficiaries. So those four tiers. Ordinary income, to the extent that the trust has current ordinary income and past undistributed ordinary income, meaning if you receive $100,000 in ordinary income in 2022, don't make any distributions and then make distributions in 2023, that's still going to be treated as taxable income when it comes out to the beneficiary, meaning you can't just hold on to it and treat it as trust principal next year. After that, capital gain income is going to be our second tier. So once you've distributed all of the ordinary income, kind of purged out all the ordinary, then we'll have capital gain income. Then if there's any tax-free income, so municipal bonds, that would be next. And then finally, at the fourth tier at the top, the tax-free return of principal, whatever they paid for that asset would come back out. So again, you've got to flush out this ordinary income first, then you can go to capital gain income that would go out to the beneficiary. Beneficiary would pay tax on that. Then if there's any tax-free income, then that would come out after you've paid out and distributed all of the prior ordinary and capital gain. Then finally, return of principal. Now, within the ordinary income and capital gain tiers, there are multiple types of income. So, you know, you think about it this way. There's the first income that's going to come out is really going to be ordinary 35% taxable income. Then we're going to have 15% qualified dividends after that. Then we've purged out all that ordinary income. Then we go to capital gain. First things there in that tier, 35% short-term capital gain income. Then 28% gain on sale of collectibles, so things like gold coins. Then 25% capital gains on sale of real property that's attributed attributable to depreciation recapture. Then after that, 15% capital gain income on the sale of securities. After that, then we get to tax-free income. If you've got muni bonds, things like that. So it's important to know that when you're using this, you're not just going to take, you know, that like what I've heard a few times, we're going to get a charitable remainder trust and it's this tax-free vehicle. Then we can swap out income and we can get some tax-free muni bonds, and really, we're never going to pay any income tax on it. It's just not going to work that way. You you still have to pay the tax man on this stuff. So as you consider a charitable remainder trust, know that it's not tax-free income. There's no such thing as that, unfortunately, outside of, well, muni bonds. But there's not going to be a way that you can put income in, kind of wash it free of this income tax, and then get tax-free income. 
If you've got something coming in, if it is tax-free, then it's going to be tax-free when it's received by the, the trustee of a charitable remainder trust. They've got to keep that ledger of the types of income because that's how the income is going to go out. If you've got something, you know, life insurance, it is tax-free when it's received uh, at post-death by a trustee. So that would be tax-free income. But if a trustee of a charitable remainder annuity trust received an annuity pay on death provision or a pay on death benefit, there's a good chance that that annuity payment is going to be ordinary income. Now again, the trustee on a charitable remainder annuity trust doesn't pay tax, but they're still going to log it in their accounting and say, hey, we received a $100,000 death payment, death benefit that is all taxable and no return of principal when our grantor, our benefactor, Joe died. We're going to have to hold this. And as we make those annuity or unit trust payments, then our beneficiary, you know, Pete, the non-charitable beneficiary, he's going to have to pay income tax on that. If there's anything left? Well, sure, we may bypass income tax if, you know, Pete had a 1% interest, 1% unit trust payment, you know, and $100,000 of income, $1,000 a year for five years, and then it goes on to the charitable beneficiary. Well, we'll call that $5,000 in that those initial payments before it goes to the charity. He'll pay, Pete will pay income tax as he receives those distributions on the $5,000. And then the remaining, call it $95,000, even though it's 1%, 1% for a unit trust payment, that 95,000 as it goes to the charity, that will be received by the charity income tax free. So 95,000 didn't get taxed, but 5,000 received by the non-charitable beneficiary did get taxed. Kind of bringing it all together, charitable remainder trusts and charitable annuity or charitable lead trusts as well can be powerful tools to avoid income tax, to avoid state gift tax, but you have to be motivated to give this stuff to a charity. It's not something that we're going to put in place just to create tax-free income because the reality is your return isn't going to be great. You're giving stuff to charity. You've got to give a good chunk of stuff to charity, and it's not something we just pull off the shelf and say, oh, let's just wash this through a charitable remainder trust, and then we don't have to pay income tax on it. That's not going to work. But it can be useful if you want to make sure you keep a slice of the assets for yourself or a loved one and then benefit a charity later on. So good question on that. Hoping we've got another question. Ah, how can trust be used to protect my privacy? So other things that we think about with trusts you know, we can put some camouflage on this bucket. How can we, you know, how can we disguise our trust so that nobody else can see it? This comes up, people do want to try and protect the privacy they have. And there are ways to limit what people can find out about you. The property records, deed records are a public, a publicly available resource that shows every time property has transferred from one person to the next. So if you buy a piece of real estate and then you sell it to somebody else, a publicly available deed shows, you know, I, John Strohmeyer, sold this piece of real property, this piece of real estate to Joe Smith. And it goes there, we show the date and perhaps what was paid for it so that when Joe goes to sell it, the title company can come in and see here, this is every time that it's been bought and sold all the way back to whenever. And that makes sure that somebody else who has a claim, we can kind of draw in and know what there are. Title companies are there to make sure there are no issues with the title. We don't do this with lots of other assets, but because real estate is so specific, they do want to do that. Well, the problem can show up if you want to buy a house, but you don't necessarily want your name out there. Perhaps you're just concerned with somebody finding you if you're famous and you don't want people to know where people where you live, or if you are a survivor of domestic abuse, you want to make sure that that, that aggressive ex-spouse can't find you, 
a trust might be a good tool to limit how people can find you. Again, remember, we have to put somebody's name down as purchasing real property. So if we have a trust, say we call it the Red Boat Trust, the Red Boat Trust doesn't necessarily identify anybody. The problem is the trustee will. So if you have, you know, if you're trying to hide your name and you're Joe Smith, well, Joe Smith, comma, trustee of the Red Boat Trust isn't going to do a whole lot because when you go into the trust records and, or not into the trust records, but into the property records, you can still do a search for Joe Smith and Joe Smith, comma, trustee is still going to show up. But if you have somebody else serve as trustee for you, you know, instead of it being Joe Smith trustee, it's Nate Brown, comma, trustee of the Red Boat Trust. You don't have to file a copy of the trust agreement showing that the Red Boat Trust is for Joe Smith. It could just be Nate Brown as trustee of the Red Boat Trust. And we'll kind of keep the rest of the trust agreement out of public view. That way, Joe Smith isn't out there publicly with his name on the property records. It's one way to keep him from being found if that's what we're looking for. Beyond that, what the trust won't help with, you're still going to have to get um, utilities. You're still going to have to figure out how to get mail to you. So the trust isn't going to solve every problem, but it will allow you to solve the one problem of we're going to have publicly facing records in the deed records that once you know how to go find and search through those records, you can find people. You can find out where, they, where they've been, when they bought things, any other things that may have been relevant to them. So trust can protect your privacy when it comes to real estate that you own in your own name. So I think that was our last question, unless anything else has come in. Nope, that is the last question. Thanks so much for watching. We will be back in two weeks with more of your questions. Next time we're going to be actually getting into, hey, I got this free advice from the internet on my tax planning. Does it make any sense? Sadly, it probably doesn't. So bad internet tax advice next time. Thanks so much for watching.